15 years as the, um, the team leader of uh, FRC Team 190. And I also teach uh, robotic engineering for all your students. Um, you might want to come to WPI, so talk to me about that. But, um, and Paul actually is one of my advisees, so I know Paul pretty well. Uh, Colleen kind of, uh, who's organized this entire uh, workshop, uh, came to me um, a few weeks ago and said, well, Ken, would you like to uh, you know, do a presentation here? And I said, well, yeah, I guess so. I'd be fine. You know? And so I said, I'd help her. And I got thinking about things that I've talked about. And, I've, and those of you who have seen me before, you know, I've talked about pneumatics and you know, motors and transmissions and uh, innovation and all that. And I hadn't really talked about driveline. So I got kind of excited about doing that. And, uh, and Colleen said, well, all you have to do really is just take one of your lectures that you uh, do to the uh, introduction to revised course and just, just make it into presentation. And so if I fall into that mode, uh, please forgive me. I am a, you know associate professor in robotic engineering. So I'm uh, hoping not to get into that part. But coming back from a uh, holiday break, I, I, um, uh, I got busy you know, playing this thing out. And, uh, and I was about halfway through this presentation. And I said, you know, I really should see what uh, people did last year. And lo and behold, I discovered that uh, there are some incredibly good presentations on drive lines in FRC. Uh, in fact, if you, how many people attended the one that was here last year on F that was a great one. That was on my Paul, actually. And, and so when I started thinking this, oh my gosh, it's like you've written a thesis and you found out someone else published a thesis you know, two weeks before you did. And so I, I decided I, I needed to uh, revise this thing. So I said, okay, this, we're going to reconsider these things. And, uh, and rather than to go over the concepts which are so well uh, uh, presented in several of the briefings, I thought I'd just hit on a few spots um, and, and maybe uh, clear up some misconceptions um, that might have existed. So that's my introduction, and oops, I gotta figure this. I'm a math guy. Okay, so they said almost everything I've said has been uh, said before, but I got to ask right now: uh, uh, How many people are rookies this year? First year. Okay, so there's a few of you. That's good. And um, and how many people know about the think tank reference site? Ah. Well, this is, this is what you learn. This is the take home, is you will find some really incredible stuff here. There's lots of sources for information for technical stuff for uh, first. You'll, you know, Chief Delphi is a great source. A lot of teams put out their own uh, white papers and all. It's really good. Uh, the Think Tank was a uh, combined uh, WPI first project to get a kind of a, um, a official source of information. So um, I did go through that last night, and I found out lots of really good ones. In fact, this was the title slide of the presentation that was given last year by Paul. It's a really good presentation. I'm copying a few things of that. Uh, here's a presentation that was given by another uh, former student of mine a few years ago, which is also very good. So if you rookies haven't seen this stuff, this is just all available on that, um, on that think tank. Uh, this was given by some people that we, we know these folks uh, pretty well. Uh, this was given a few years before that, another really good treatise. And here's one that's um, you know, in 2005, which is also quite good and academic and uh, all really good. And so I got thinking about this, what can I say that's different or what can I say that, that uh, would appeal to me? And so I, I decided that, that um, in typical professor fashion, uh, you guys have homework. Your homework is to review those, those other presentations. And after you've done that, you understand these are the sort of things you know. And, and, and those veterans will have already known what, those, what, what we're talking about. So I will not be discuss, discussing these things. We know what four-wheel drive robot looks like. Um, this one particularly has the uh, Omni wheels, which we'll refer to later in this presentation. The Omni wheels are those wheels on the, on the left side that have little rollers on them. Uh, for rookies who don't understand those, those are very, very useful for doing some of the things we'll talk about today. Six-wheel drive robots are, are fairly common. Um, you know, it's a, um, we'll just talk about them a little bit as well. Uh, you know, as Paul said in his presentation, at some point every team decides I want to make it, you know, a crawler shredded robot. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Now under steering systems, skid steering, uh, you should know what that's about. That's, that's just like you move one side faster than the other and it, and it turns and that's, that's skidding. But we'll talk about that quite a bit. If you want to talk about swerve and crab drives, um, this is not the place to get into the technical parts about that because uh, I'm just not going to focus on that, but I'll tell you it does exist and, and uh, there's lots of good reasons for using that. I can talk about those as much as you'd like to afterwards, but it won't be on here. And of course, everybody's favorite are mechanerma holonomic drive lines. Um, these last two ones are fairly um, 
a fairly complex systems, but um, the, the, the only new news about these is that uh, unlike it, uh, unlike when Teams first developed them, um, the team I was with started working on Swerve drives in uh, '98 and Holonomic 2005. You don't have to make them yourselves anymore. You can actually buy these things commercially off the off the shelf, which is pretty uh, enabling for a new team. But but here's the things that I hear. In fact, um, in my class that just ended uh, in December, or yeah, December, uh, there were about 70 students, mostly freshmen, and about half of them, surprisingly, came not surprisingly, maybe, but half of them came from uh, FRC high school teams, and yet. Here's the things that I heard from these guys as they were building their, their project robots. First off, they were convinced that the bigger the wheel you have, the faster the robot. It just makes sense, right? Because in faster, they said, was always better. These are misconceptions. Um, certainly, that the more wheels you have, the more traction. Now, here's the thing that I have with, with Paul on this, but we, we argue back and forth on that. Uh, and also, the assumption is that the more traction a robot has, that's always better. Not necessarily. We're going to talk about that. Uh, clearly, the easier the turning your robot is, the easier it is to control. And that just should be obvious, right? Not really. And, and then, of course, with complexity comes capability. You know, so uh, mechanism and holonomic uh, drive lines are certainly uh, a lot of my students saying this is the ideal drive line for a robot because it is complex. Therefore, it must be more capable. Uh, and then finally, the uh, ultimate argument is that um, you know everybody wants to go with treads because they give you the maximum traction. I mean, that's that's obviously why tanks and, and earth movers use these things, or or is it? These are the things I hear. And so in this presentation, I'm going to clarify some of those bits, assuming that you all know what what we're talking about when we talk about four-wheel drive robots and and six-wheel drive robots. And and I will not be talking about two-wheel drive robots because. In the glorious words of, uh, of uh, Woody Flowers, they inhale forcefully. And if you don't know what that means, you, you yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, unless you're in an in a, in a unusual game where there is no robot-to-robot uh, -robot interaction, uh, Shades 2001, um, which I don't think we'll ever revisit, uh, you know, having a robot that has caster wheels and two-wheel drive is, is generally not a real good idea. So I'm not going to talk about those, nor will I talk about legged robots uh, or any of the other kind of uh, uh, eccentric uh, drive lines. This is going to talk about mainstream drive lines. Now, let me just give you a little history about um, one team. This happens to be Team 190's history. And if you look at the uh, robots the last 20 years, these are the kinds of generic drive lines that this team has used. Uh, first four years with just uh, four-wheel drive skid steering. We did put in a transmission in 95. Uh, and you can look at it year by year. You see six-wheel drive, four-wheel drive. You see our first uh, produced swerve drive was in 99. Uh, we updated that with a two-speed in 2000. And then we went on to skid and started putting in omni wheels. We made our own omni wheels, which again, are those wheels with the rollers that reduce the uh, transverse um, uh, friction. Um, then we, we moved back then to four-wheel drive skid steering, and we did crab at that time in 2003. Now, for those of you um, who understand swerving, swerve drives are modules which you can turn basically any degrees you want to, and you can strafe or do some complicated things with them. The way, when I say crab drive, crab drive to me means you have a fixed orthogonal drive system that, you know, you, you can either go straight ahead or you can flip a button and go sideways, like a crab. And so that's when I talk about crab, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, in 2005, the team experimented with our first holonomic uh, mechanism-based uh, uh, drive lines. Went back to skid for a uh, six-wheel drive skid for another two years. Um, in 09, we we went with a dual swerve system, which some people have, where you control your front and rear um, swerve independently, so you can get quasi Ackerman or car steering. You can get uh, counter steering. You can get all sorts of interesting uh, stuff there. 2010, we went back to holonomic mechanism. And then in 2000, last year, we went back to a six-wheel drive uh, skid with Omni wheels. first time we tried that. So what you see here is that for, we've used skid-steered robots for 15 out of 20 years. So that's what I'm mostly going to talk about today because it's a very robust system. Um, some people have said that the most important single system in any robot is your drive line. You know, um, those of you who have been around a while will 
bemoan the fact that sometimes your complex robot sits on the sides, unchosen to go into the files when a literal robust box on wheels has seated higher than you and proceeds to be picked by someone who just wants somebody reliable. So trust me, drive lines are very important. And in fact, the number one characteristic about a drive line that makes it advantageous is its reliability. And so skid steered robots have a place. Now there is lots of coolness. You will, for rookies particularly, you may fall into that trap of saying, oh, this, this is so simple, I need to find something more complex, it's more challenging, and you can get some really interesting capabilities with non-skid steered robots, with swerve drive, polynomic, other odd and unusual uh, bits. Uh, we certainly have uh, gone down that road and, and still continue to go down that road now and then. But I'm just, I'll be talking about skid steered robots now because it is robust, it is effective, the only time Team 190 ever made it to uh, Einstein was with a steered, steered, uh, skid-driven robot, and so um, we know that it, it works. Okay, so rather than talk I mean, again about the sorts of types of, of drive lines, I'm just going to talk about what drive lines should be doing for you. These are the kind of attributes that a drive line um, should be able to provide. And I'll, again, the number one not written here is reliability and, and robust design, so it can be redundant, you know, if the chain falls off, you want to keep driving if you can. If the wheel falls off, it's nice to be able to keep driving then as well. So, but we're not going to talk about talk about these sorts of things. Okay, speed does not depend upon the size of the wheels. You know, it's strictly a matter of, of uh, how much output power you can put to your drive line, and then the velocity, the maximum velocity you can have on a robot is going to depend upon the amount of rolling resistance and drag you have. Um, um, you know, divide that into the uh, uh, power you can provide, and that will give you your, your maximum velocity. So there's lots of things to consider here, but wheel size is not one of them. Trust me, there's there are a lot better ways of, of getting high speed than, than going big wheels. And in fact, given the same motors and trying to get the optimum speed, a smaller wheeled robot will be faster. And the basic reason why is that because it takes less gearing from the motor down to the uh, axle, if you have a smaller um, uh, diameter, higher speed wheel, which means you have lower losses. The more gearing you have to have, the more losses you have with your motors. And so frankly, everything else is the same. A large wheeled robot will theoretically be a slower robot than a smaller wheeled robot. Crawler tread does cause incredible amount of drag. If you're talking about um, efficient uh, speed, uh, going with crawler treads is not the way to go. You find very few quarter mile dragsters which use crawler tread. And yet you think traction is pretty important for those guys because it just absorbs an incredible amount of energy. But more important than that, just when the ending, uh, the, the hard hitting part here about speed is that, uh, you know, the, the right speed is not the fastest speed. Um, years ago, a, a team that I'm very familiar with came up with a uh, an incredibly fast robot. In fact, they called this transmission, they call it LSD, which meant ludicrous speed drive. That's what I thought y'all thought it meant. And, the, uh, 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 and it turns out that it was a 20 foot per second, um, a 21 foot per second uh, robot, and it was added absolutely well named. It was ludicrous, it was unusable, um, and in fact, even though the robot would go faster, by the time you accelerated to it and got stopped to do something, it really didn't save you any time across the field. So be careful about that. The best speed is no faster than required. We'll talk a little bit later about that. Here's really what I want to talk mostly about, and this is my little lecture part of the session, is, is turning ability. How much energy does it take to turn this? And again, we're going to concentrate on skid-steered robots because that's kind of a prevalent uh, feature for most robots. In fact, this really becomes a non-issue if you have steerable wheels or holonomic drive, because technically those do not skid, which means that uh, if you have the geometry right and your codes right, uh, they take no more energy to turn than to go straight line. But for skid steering, there's, there's reasons why it takes energy. Now, there's lots of factors that go into how much energy and power it requires, and has to do with the uh, how much how much um, skid resistance there is, the transverse traction of the wheels. You know, wheels in general are pretty much homogeneous. In other words, they have the same coefficient of friction whether they're going forward or being skidded sideways, unless you have something which modifies that by like putting rollers on them, omni wheels, or um, some other uh, devices like that. 
center of gravity location, of course, also affects how much effort it takes to turn. We'll talk about that. And then the ratio of the wheel base, which is the distance from the front to rear axles, and the wheel track, which is the distance from the left and right uh, wheels. The combination of those factors, all those factors, comes up, which, is, which is, comes to a feature which is called the virtual turning center, the VTC, which is what? You can, you, it, it, you can compute it, but you can also see it on a robot. If you, if you go full counter steering on a robot and you put your finger over the point which is not, which is just pivoting and not doing a circle, that is the virtual turning center. And it varies significantly based upon the CG location, the kinds of traction the wheels have, and the ratio of the, um, of the wheel base and wheel track. The lesson here is that it makes a dramatic difference in how much energy is required to turn a robot. The closer the virtual turning center is to a driven axle, the less resistance it takes to turn the robot. Um, and in easy turning robots, you should know why you want them and how easy, how much easy is what you want and how and what happens if you make it too easy to turn. But these are things we need to not talk about. If you look down at a um, at a robot, now those people, is there anybody here that's from my class? There, I knew a couple students came down, but they would recognize this is one of the homework problems. Um, if you look down on a robot, a four-wheel drive robot, this is looking down, uh, this is the tire patch, if you will, looking uh, vertically down. The center of gravity is shown in the middle here, and, and in fact, uh, this robot uh, that I, in this example is one which has identical uh, wheels, all four wheels are all driven, and it turns out that the virtual turning center is, is co-located with the center of gravity projection. It's important to say projection because if this robot was going up a hill, uh, then the uh, projection would slide um, to, the, to the lower altitude axle and it would turn out that the robot would turn much easier. In fact, you probably notice that on robots. If you go up a hill, it becomes much, much less stable in going straight. Well, this is what we talk about when we, when we do the analysis of how much effort it takes. You have the force provided by the motors, which I represent there as the force of M's, and to turn here, if I do the left side forward and the right side, uh, the bottom on, on uh, aft, of course, then it will spin around in the, uh, uh, in the clockwise direction. If you do the analysis on this, if you look at just one wheel, there's some interesting things happen. This is a little bit of vector analysis here, and it's this there's an interesting and quite doable algebra that, that takes care of all this, but if you look at that turning center, I'm looking at the aft left wheel now only, you see that the, the force of the motor applied at the, at the wheel provides a, uh, a force which, which gives you a twisting torque to make the robot turn to the right. The force of friction here, the F sub F there, is the friction which is opposing the actual direction that the robot's going to move. In this case, the robot actually is going to move in that doubled arrow direction. That wheel is going to rotate about that center point, and you would find that the, uh, the, the direction, the vector of the wheel would be in that doubled arrow uh, up there to the uh, upper right. And so the force of friction resists that path. Now here's where the interesting thing comes is that um, if you look at the force of friction being can broken into two vectors, there, there's one dotted vector which goes straight down here, which I have uh, called uh, force of friction prime, which is going straight down, and that's a dotted uh, vector. That is the only transverse friction which influences the turning behavior. That's the one that causes turning drag. That is the one, that direction of that, of that force of friction is the only part that actually slows the robot down from turning. And that's the one that balances the, the, uh, the impetus from the motors to cause the robot to turn. And so you can imagine right now that if you do something to reduce that force of friction in the prime direction, for example, put an omnibus which has virtually none in that, then it dramatically reduces the amount of, of um, force of the motor has to produce to make the same turn. Now, um, just, to, uh, just to give you a little bit more interest on this, I, one of the questions I had for my students is, what happens if the, if the virtual turning center, which starts in the middle of this robot, ends up migrating to one end, for example, going up a hill, so the, the center of gravity starts to um, get closer and closer to one of the axles. Well, it turns out once the virtual turning center gets right to either on top of the front axle or the back axle, depending on whether it's going uphill or downhill, then the resistance to turning is zero because there's no more weight on the front wheels or the back wheels, depending on whether going forward or backwards, and so there can be no more friction developed by them, and there is no transverse frictional uh, force required by wheels when you're turning right between the axles. And so this is what happens. The maximum resistance of turning always happens 
uh, when the, the vertical turning center is exactly between the front and rear axle. Once it's closer to one side or the other side, it takes much less effort to make that same turn. So this is the key to managing uh, not only uh, how much effort it takes to turn, but also managing where the robot will turn, which has advantages in terms of placement of end effectors. So we'll get back onto that subject a little bit more, but I wanted to talk about a couple other things here which can be influenced by the driveline. Certainly tractive force, how much pushing effort can you uh, provide? or how steep of a hill can be climbed is influenced by drive lines as well. Now there's two ways that you can limit uh, how much uh, force a robot can push with. One would be when the motors stall out and you run out of torque. This is the equivalent of trying to, to pull a boat off a ramp and keeping your car in high gear rather than using low gear because it simply stalls and it doesn't move. Uh, the other way would be when your wheels spin. When you, when you lose traction, you have plenty of, of torque coming to the axle, plenty of motor performance, but the wheels lose traction. You should all know that you only want ever that second case to be the habit in your robot. You always want to be traction limited. If you have, if you're not traction limited, you don't have this robot geared properly. The final test that we always do with our robots, and I do that even in our classes, is that take your robot up against a brick wall or a wall of some sort on the surface that you're going to be playing with and apply full power to it. If it does not spin the wheels, you're in big trouble. Because that means your motor stalled. And, and for those of you who, who look at any of the motor um, uh, briefings and the motor presentations, you'll discover that a stalled motor has a very, very, very short life. Uh, especially with certain kinds of motors that immediately release that wonderful magic smoke that, that uh, is what electrical engineers put inside the motors to make them work. Because uh, once that smoke goes out, you know, they no longer work. Now here's this thing about traction is kind of a, a controversial subject. Um, you know, uh, again, it's been said in a lot of other briefings, we all have been, well, maybe not all of us, but most of us have been through physics and understand that nowhere does the area of contact enter into the force of friction available through normal interaction between two materials. It's simply based upon how much force is pushing down between the surfaces, the normal force, and then the sort of material that exists between those two surfaces, whether it's rubber on carpet, or rubber on asphalt, or, or plastic on uh, fiberglass. So it implies that if, if you have the same materials, then it really makes no difference how many wheels you have driven, or in fact, you do have a tread. Now, in reality, we know this is not quite correct, because um, treaded vehicles always work much better if you have if you have some surface which is irregular, for example, if you have gravel or sand or mud or something that needs high flotation, then area of contact to the extreme of tread is a big advantage. That's for flotation mostly. But it turns out that under, uh, under materials which are pretty much homogeneous, which is like carpet and, and, um, and the kind of wheels you put on a robot, it really makes not much difference. You'd be very you'd be very surprised to find out that a four-wheel drive robot would push against a six-wheel drive robot and have no particular issue. It just depends upon who has the stickiest wheels at the moment. It really makes almost no difference. So do not let that be a hang-up for deciding to go with six, eight, twelve-wheel drive. It really makes no difference there, no appreciative difference. There's three axes of stability you have to be concerned with on a robot. There is pitch, which means does it fall forward or fall backwards. There is roll, does it fall to the left or the right? And then there is yaw, which means does it turn left to right? Well, two of those are not too useful. We just soon have a robot as stiff as possible in the pitching axis and the rolling axis. We like to have it manageable in the yaw axis, but uh, so the drive line can be very uh, significant in, in doing this. You know, uh, if you look at where, if you look back on this uh, previous slide about uh, this, uh, looking down this robot, you'll see that the four-wheel drive describes a rectangular, rectangular shape between the points of contact. That's called the polygon of contact. The larger that area is, the more stable your robot will become. Because as long as the center of gravity falls projected into that boundary of that, of that polygon, then the robot will not tip over. So you want to max for stability, you want to maximize the polygon of contact. Now that has some interesting implications, which some people um, have not totally understood, including uh, a team I'm familiar with, Team 190. 
large wheels will always reduce stability. You need to understand that because in first rules, the overall size of the robot is constrained, which means you put a large wheel, your, your polygonal contact shrinks because you have to raise the wheel, which has to be inside of that contact area. The smaller the wheels you have, the more stable your robot becomes. Now, remember we said also small wheels technically could mean a faster robot, so we're seeing two things that lead this towards small wheels is a good solution. Uh, but there's other things. Uh, I'll make a comment now about swerve drive as well. It's often said that swerve drive modules, which are the modules where each wheel can be independently steered, they offer some really unique capabilities. They also take up a lot of of landscape and footprint on the robot itself for other devices. But, but in terms of stability, it significantly reduced, again, the polygon of contact. Because rather than having your wheels on the far outside edges of your robot, they have to be moved inward so that when they rotate 90 degrees, they'll still be within inside the confines of your, your maximum size of your robot. And so another reason why um, the uh, straight skid steered robots turn out to be quite well, they will be the most stable. Okay, here it gets down to one of the most difficult to assess features of robots. This is handling. You know, it, you would think that if it turns easy and it goes fast, the drivers will love it. Yeah. No, not necessarily because uh, you can be too fast and you can certainly be too easily turned to make good handling. Handling is best defined as how fast and how efficient are your drivers at getting to where you want to get on the field. High speed is not necessarily the answer. Certainly ease of turning, which would be like a two-wheel drive robot, turns incredibly easy. These are not things you, that are really going to be good for handling. But if you think about it, there are two different domains we, that a robot has to contend with. There is the one which is the high speed, the tra traversing from one side of the field to the other, or, or from one objective to another. This requires a distinctly different kind of handling characteristic than the close when the front wheels were steering. And so uh, that's kind of 
an ideal uh, robot here might you might drive it in one direction when you're transiting the field and then have your end effect on the other direction so you can have that fine maneuverability. But this is something to think about. But, but just understand that the concept of the virtual training center is really critical to that. So I'll, here's some general suggestions that work regardless of the kind of drive line you have, whether it's six-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, but it's track drive. We have suffered from 20 years of designing robots, some abysmally slow, some abysmally fast. We have had people tell us how fast their robots are, and then we actually see them and measure them and we find out what they really are. Uh, teams have a tendency to really overestimate the speed of their robots. It seems kind of a macho thing, you know, saying, oh, we do 18 feet per second, we do 20 feet per second, we do 20 miles an hour. I've heard teams say that, which is 30, 33 feet per second, I think. Um, we have found that our fastest, most, uh, most um, uh, controllable robots do about 10 feet per second. That is a really good speed for a single speed robot. If you have multiple speed robots, uh, then you can have your high gear uh, go a bit faster. But, but anybody that has a robot that goes over 15, anybody here have a robot that they think goes over 15 feet per second? Yeah. Well, you were smarter than we because we designed one that went 20 and it was way too fast. If you go over 15, uh, yeah. does it 15? Now, do you guys, is it single speed? Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, just be careful. That's, uh, you know, uh, normally those high-speed robots would be very difficult to do close in maneuvers because you don't have enough torque available to do the close in maneuvers. And if you have a track vehicle, just, just drop everything by, you know, 25% off, of, off of those speeds because of the additional drag of the track. Again, if you have, if you only have, if your lowest gear on your robot, if you cannot spin the wheels when you come up against a fixed, fixed obstacle, then you are geared too high for safety and you'll pop circuit, uh, the circuit uh, protectors on your motors, you'll overheat the motors and your drivers will be saying, there's a code problem because it doesn't turn anymore. Well, no, you just overheat the motor. If you have wheels, and most of you skid steer people will, you should really endeavor to have them all powered. You will see robots that have been successful in the past that have caster wheels on one side and, and, high, and driven wheels on the other. But Never if they have a lot of interaction with other robots because they're so easily pushed around. They're almost uncontrollable any kind of a side slope. Who knows what they'll be on the field this year. Uh, just understand that uh, uh, all the wheels should be, should be powered. And if you really have really high traction, you've got to be very careful to make sure you're geared low enough. You can get away with high gearing as long as you don't have really great traction. But if you have really good traction, uh, which is a pretty good thing to have, then you want to make sure your gearing is enough so you can spin those. A couple other things here in general. Uh, the center of gravity, there is never a reason I can imagine to have a high center of gravity. One year we were at a competition with a rookie team and they had their battery mounted on top of their shoulder as a, a counterbalance to an arm. And uh, you know the battery is 10% of your robot weight and it had up like four feet in the air. And they said, well, why did you have, I said, why do you have that? They said, well, because they took our bucket of rocks off. <laughs> they had a real problem with CG. And when they first arrived, they actually had a bucket and they had rocks in the back of it. And, and they were appalled when they found out that rocks were not on the approved list of parts you can have on, a, on an FRC robot. This is 2001. I don't think you can still use rocks or not. I think you can now, so you don't pay too much for it. But back in those days, you had to buy things off of SPI, Small Parts Incorporated Catalog, and there were no rocks for sale. And so uh, they took it off quickly and they put their 13 pound battery up there and any turn at all, that thing was on its side. So keep it low, uh, keep it centered. And uh, another thing about this for CG and, and keeping things low is that we have large wheels that Team 190 has ever built uh, for a robot were 12 inch diameter, or maybe 15, no, they're 12 I guess. That robot was upside down more than it was uh, when it was on. We had that, it was so calm for that robot tip over that we actually had an automatic rewriting uh, uh, software in it. So even during the autonomous, which it, it was the first year of autonomous 2003, it would end up upside down almost every time. And so we had a little clearing maneuver to put it back on its feet. And that was the last time we built wheels that big. OK, for handling and uh, turning effort, you really need to know and manage where the virtual training center is going to be. You've got to have the optimal performance. It doesn't mean it wants to be the easiest turning because easy turning makes poor handling at high speed. 
Uh, but there are all these things you can do. We're talking about some specifics here on on um, on uh, robot types. But for example, considering Omni wheels for a four wheel drive robot or six wheel drive robot or a drop center, which we'll talk about a little bit, uh, or six wheel drive robots, is a good consideration to uh, to handle the virtual turning center and and turning effort. So, so we're talking about skid steering. Let's see exactly again how we can manage that. Uh, recall from that earlier slide that uh, if your wheels are all the same and they're all driven, then the center of gravity where it impacts the, the polygonic contact will coincide with the virtual turning center. So if you have a centralized center of gravity and you have a four-wheel drive robot or a six-wheel drive robot and they're all the same wheels, when you turn it on a full counter tier, turn, it should turn right about over its center of gravity. Now, as soon as you change the wheels such that, that either the front or the back has less transverse traction, it will, this, the virtual turning center will move immediately toward the axle which has a higher transverse traction. That's because if you look at the sum of moments, you'll find out that the moments will cause that thing to shift down so it comes in balance. So if you put omni wheels in the front, the virtual turning center moves to the back and vice versa. So again, as I say here, that, that under an ideal condition, you would like to have the Omni wheels in the front for high speed driving because it drives kind of like a car. The front wheels turn, and it feels like the front wheels are turning because the center of, of turning becomes near the back. And then the robot will be much more stable, it will not tend to spin out like it does the other way. But on the other hand, for precision, you really want to make sure the, the, uh, the factor is on the opposite end of that. Okay, four wheel drive robots. Very, very stable in yaw. Remember, there's three axes of stability. And there's the two we don't like, and yaw, we would like to turn. They are very, very stable. The most stable. Uh, of the drive lines we're going to talk And they're probably too stable. In other words, they just don't want to turn. Omni wheels is one way around that. It works pretty well. In fact, it turns out that uh, it will dramatically do it. If you have a really high quality Omni wheels which has virtually no resistance in the rolling, it moves the virtual turning center all the way back to the other end of the robot, right between the uh, non-Omni wheel axle, which is likely going to be more than you want to do. A few years ago, some teams I saw putting Omni wheels on diagonal, opposite diagonal corners of the robot, and I was intrigued by that. Couldn't figure out really what, what that was doing until you look at the equations and discover it, asked, it just pretty much drops the turning effort in one half because you only develop only one half of each of those ends develops transverse um, friction and the normal force is distributed between, between the ones with friction and the ones without. So it really reduces the turning effort by one half, which is a useful figure. Um, it, it also does not affect the virtual turning center. It keeps the virtual turning center still over the center of gravity as opposed to the other end, which will, if you, if you move, put on wheels on, on one end, it will probably reduce turning effort by about 90%. But it'll also shift that virtual turning center, which you may want to do. There is a problem, of course, by having diagonally opposed omni wheels. If you start going up a side slope where you only have one wheel in contact at, at, at one moment, you may have some.
reduce it by about two thirds. Uh, it keeps the virtual turning center straight over the center of gravity, as if you had no other. It may be good for you, it may not be, but it will have it will turn more easily. When and in the previous um, uh, presentations, they, they talk about taking the center of your six wheel, you know, three axles, and dropping having about an eighth of an inch. Of Three sixteenths of an inch lower, then this will dramatically decrease the turning effort to the point where it may reduce it more than you want. By the way, uh, it, the virtual turning center will move almost exactly over that center axle, and it will actually act for a while almost like a two-wheel drive robot with caches. It will spin so easily, especially the center of gravity is roughly over the top of that. But the, the turning center will vary a little bit whether you're riding on the back wheels or the front wheels. It'll have a little bit of uh, a variability there, but it's, it's actually a very successful system. But I tell you right now that it will be prone to oversteering, and there may be some handling issues with that. Um, this year was the first year we ever experimented putting level six-wheel drive and just putting one axle omni wheels on one end, and it was very controversial on our team because handling is. And so we had the students drive full sets. We had it modifiable, so you could have a drop center down with all six even wheels, or have it level with omni wheels in the front. And the drivers unanimously chose this system, level with omni wheels on one end. What it does is it reduces the turning to a four-wheel drive robot with a much shorter wheelbase. With only the four wheels, which have no omni wheels, will develop turning resistance. It also moves the virtual turning center back into a fixed position, regardless of whether you're accelerating or decelerating on a purposeful ones. Uh, for example, this year and last year's game, we had a little alignment challenge to get lined perfectly and quickly into the towers for launching a minibus. We made sure that the uh, that our omni wheels were in the, the were leading as we came into the um, uh, tower base so they would automatically line easy because there's no resistance to turning on the omni wheel end. And then when we did the other high speed driving we, we went the other direction because we wanted the uh you see when we, when we did our, um, our precision alignment for the tubes, we did the other end because we want the virtual turning center to be forward close to our end effector. So that was a, a solution for that. Just, just quickly about the uh, tank thread is that it's very similar to six-wheel drive. You have the same ways of, of correcting it. If you drop setter, you'll make it radically lower. The virtual turning center will be over CG if you don't do that. Um, okay, so here. Please get these. First off, drive motors, if you can't spin them while you're stopped against the wall, then you should really reevaluate your gearing. These are, these are some rules of thumb speeds here. We think it worked pretty well. If you have wheels, drive them all. Take the effort to put a chain and chain them all up. Don't have non-powered non wheels. And good handling is best determined by your drivers. It is a combination of events. But understand that, that high speed and easy turning are not the secrets. You have to have the right balance of turning and straight line stability. Moderate turning effort correlates with good handling and resistance to pushing. Remember, an easy turning robot is also easily turned by anybody else. So be careful about that. Precision loading and unloading is very important. It, it makes no, there's no uh, net effect if you can be the first one to get to an objective because you have a high speed robot and then you can't maneuver it in that fine manner to actually do your, your loading. Omni wheels are a solution that really is very effective for any skid steered robot. You'll find that it will control, control not only your virtual turning center, but also the turning effort. We do it right. This was a 2007 robot that we built. It had drop center six wheel drive. We went on and it worked pretty well. Um, that's the last year we did that. So that was a fire hose on, on, on a few things there. The, the take homes were to understand that um, uh, skid steering is a robust way of driving. Do not think like you're, you're backing off on capability by going to a skid steered robot. Uh, it it will be the most stable robot you can build. It will be the quickest you can get on the ground, which is important. And with the right control of the center of gravity and the virtual turning center, you can make it into an incredibly good handling robot. Any questions? Yep. You have a choice of the Omni wheels. A lot of times the wheels get blown out. Yeah. Yeah, we have uh, we uh, we have uh, most of our Omni wheels in Team 90 have been home built, but recently we've been we've been purchasing them. I think the ones this year 
were from, were they Andy Mark? I think they were Andy Mark wheels this year. And, um, and so the smaller your wheels, normally the more robust they are as well. The bigger wheels tend to get more side loads on them and, and all that. So we've been using, we used Andy Mark this year. Yes. Yes, it does. Um, um, you know, any time that you apply full uh, throttle or, or, or voltage to a motor and it's not going to turn, that means one of the things that can happen is either going to overheat the motor dramatically or it's going to pop circuit breakers. Neither of which are desirable. And it really just means you have too much traction or too high of gearing. It, it, I don't care what kind of drive you have, whether it's crawler tread. Four-wheel drive, mechanism, swerve drive. If you can't spin the wheels, it, you should really reconsider. Yep. You want to do that testing on the whole robot right now. Oh gosh, I mean this, this is so. How many teams build a functional driving robot like a week four and they get all the driver packs on there and they forget to balance the robot up? If you do that, it, you're learning the wrong stuff. We insist upon our guys putting steel plates. You don't have to text on it. You need to get the robot to the condition that's going to be driving when you test all of that. Absolutely, thank you. Is time for one more question? If not, take a break. Thank you. <laughs>